Spur, it's not the most active volcano in Cook Inlet. Augustine is. But it is the closest volcano to Anchorage. It's only 80 miles west of here, due west. And it's also a tall volcano. It's just over 11,000 feet tall, and it's a lot of, a lot of snow and ice is on this volcano. My name is Gay McChimsey, and I'm a volcanologist with the Alaska Volcano Observatory, U.S. Geological Survey in Anchorage, Alaska. The only historic eruptions that we know of occurred, the first one was in 1953, and it was a single eruption. It lasted about an hour, and put ash up to about 50,000 feet. So in 1992, when Spur became restless, there was about a 10-month lead up to that eruption. Seismologists began to see the seismic events increase. Swarms began. We began measuring gas over there and saw that, that, that there was more gas coming out, both CO2 and SO2. The lake turned from a beautiful turquoise color to a battleship gray color, which is indicative of absorption of SO2 into the lake waters. And then on the afternoon of June 27th, 1992, Spur erupted. And it erupted just a, almost a carbon copy of what it had done in July of 1953. Up, 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 except the eruption was about three hours long. And right at the end of that eruption, the seismicity returned practically to background. It just, it just went totally quiet. We are standing in front of uh, many monitors that are showing seismic data from various stations that we have in our volcano monitoring networks uh, throughout Alaska. So each of these individual screens, some of the monitors have three stations showing, some have four, some have a single station. Each of these is for a seismometer that's buried in the ground around one of our volcanoes. For volcanoes that are seismically monitored, they're all really very quiet or what we call background levels, meaning that they are in their sort of background or quiet state at this point. Uh, we have seismologists who look at all the data from all of our seismometers a couple of times a day to kind of monitor and, and see, oh, do we have an uptick anywhere or a little seismic swarm anywhere? Um, but all the ones you see up here are really fairly quiet. You'll see some uh, for example, some of the stations, it, it looks like the lines are getting thicker. That could be wind noise. Wind shake, actually shakes the ground and causes very high frequency noise on the seismometers. I can remember it like it was yesterday. On the afternoon of August 18th, so you know, a month and a half after that first eruption, there was a, uh, there was a call from the FAA that said, we've gotten a pilot report that something is going on at Mount Spur. So we all hurried down to the ops room and looked at the, at, at the seismic records and there was nothing unusual. It looked just like it had looked for the last six weeks. So after another call comes in, another pilot report says that something is going on at Mount Spur. We're not quite sure what, but something is going on. And Mount Spur wasn't visible from Anchorage on that day because there was a low overcast. Tina Neal was acting scientist in charge. She told me to go get an airplane and go out and see what I could see. I couldn't find anybody to go with me. I was going around the halls asking anybody, you want to go for an observation flight over the spur? And nobody, you know, everybody had their day. I mean, I was asking geologists in the minerals group. I was asking hydrologists, anybody. Finally, I got a hydrologist who happened to be walking down the hall to go home. And he said, oh, sure, why not? And then I got the wife of one of our um, technicians to go along. And we went to the airport. And by, and, and by the time that, w that we were rolling down the tarmac, I got a radio call from, from, from Tina in the ops room that an eruption of spur was confirmed, that it was now showing up seismically as, as, as a major eruption. So we, we were airborne seconds later, and within less than a minute, we popped through the weather clouds and immediately could see this vertical eruption column, which you'll see on this video that I gave you. This eruption has been assigned a volcano explosivity index of three, which compares to an index of four for the 1953 eruption of Crater Peak, and a five for the May 18th, 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. And we flew over. Because there was a fairly strong wind that day, we were able to get on the back side of, of Spur and fly traverses back and forth, and so we got fairly close. When we got within probably a half mile of, of, of the actual erupting column, we could see blocks the size of, at least the size of Volkswagens, if not larger, uh, being tossed uh, several thousand meters up, up into the air. Note the shock waves emanating from the left base of the column as bands of light. Couldn't 
You can actually see the vent itself because it was just under the clouds where we could see these roiling clouds bellowing up through and the column I think I think it was about 47,000 feet is what that column went to before it, it hit the tropopause and, and fanned out and the wind was blowing from the west so ash was going to Anchorage so we stayed over there for about 45 minutes long enough to get these photographs and, and video and, and, and observations uh, but then we had to hurry back essentially outrun the ash cloud back to Anchorage so we could land before ash began falling at the airport because it subsequently closed the airport and three and three millimeters of ash fell on the city. I can say that the 1992 eruptions of Spur, there were three of them. One was, the first one was June 27th, the second one was August 18th, and the third one was September 16, 17. And the first eruption produced about 40 million cubic meters of ash. And each of the, of the other two eruptions produced about 50 million cubic meters of ash. Okay. And that's a lot of ash. <laughs>